Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Hilary Mann Leverett, a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs at Yale and CEO of Stratega, a political risk consultancy that focuses on international energy and financial markets. She has served in the State Department and at the National Security Council at the White House during the George H. W. Bush, Clinton, and George W. Bush administrations. In the George W. Bush administration, Ms. Leverett worked as the director for Iran, Afghanistan, and Persian Gulf Affairs at the National Security Council, as Middle East specialist on the Security of States policy planning staff, and as political advisor for Middle East and Central Asian issues for the U.S. mission to the United Nations. Today we'll talk with Professor Leverett about Iran and the future of American power. Welcome, Professor Leverett. Thank you for having me. You currently are working on a book with your husband, Flint Leverett, mm -hmm. called Going to Tehran, Iran and the Future of American Power. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about it and what's its premise. Well, the going to Tehran part of it takes on um, what I would call many myths mm -hmm. that I, maybe even most Americans have about Iran, both its foreign policy and its domestic politics. Mm -hmm. So the going to Tehran is really to go to take you to Tehran into the decision making, the thought process, um, both in terms of foreign policy and domestic politics inside the Islamic Republic. The second piece of, of, of the title, the mm -hmm. Amer and the Future of American Power, makes a policy argument that if you go through, if you do a sober analysis of Iran's foreign policy um, strategy mm -hmm. and a really clear understanding of its domestic politics, you come to the conclusion that the United States needs, needs to deal with the Islamic Republic as it is that it's going to be an enduring uh, political order in the region for some time, and that for the United States to maintain, if not restore, its credibility in the Middle East, it needs to have a fundamentally more constructive relationship with the Islamic Republic as it is. And in order, in order for the United States to retain its global power, the United States must have a more credible position in the Middle East which the book makes this part policy argument, one of the only ways the United States can do that today is to have a more constructive relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Why do you feel it's important to write the book? The, uh, coming back to my first point, that I think most of what most Americans think they know about Iran is wrong, mm -hmm. I think it's critically important at this point in time to write a book that takes on each of the myths that we have about the Islamic Republic. In particular, there's a, there's a policy reason to do so, a broader reason to do so, which is that in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, it took many years for the American political dynamic, American political elites, to get to the position where not only the invasion of Iraq was, the decision to invade Iraq was taken, but with so much American political elite buy-in mm -hmm. from the opposing political party, the Democratic political party at the time, within Congress, among academics even, among the media, there was a, there was a broad, uh, broad based buy-in to, to invade Iraq based on what we found out later to be a lot of very faulty and unquestioned assumptions mm -hmm. about, uh, about Iraqi politics, about Iraqi leadership, Iraq's position in the Middle East. Those same questions, I think the, those questions and assumptions about how we view the Islamic Republic of Iran need to be taken now, we need to question our fundamental assumptions about the Islamic Republic in a way that we did not in the lead up to the war in Iraq. Because I think we are on a trajectory toward conflict with the Islamic Republic. So two of the most important examples I think we need to take on, two of the most important assumptions we need to take on, is first in terms of foreign policy. There is a widely held assumption that Iran is an ideologically immature, irrational polity that cannot take decisions based on its material state national interests. Well, I'm one of the very few American officials that had the opportunity to deal with, to negotiate with Iranian officials because we don't have a diplomatic relationship and because of the antagonism between the United States and the Islamic Republic, the U.S. government essentially forbids its diplomats from dealing with Iranian officials. So very few American officials had had the opportunity to even speak to Iranian officials. So they don't really have any firsthand information, understanding 
about Iran's strategic dilemmas, their, their national security concerns, their legitimate interests. Because of my work on Afghanistan, I was authorized to deal with my Iranian counterparts on the narrow issue of Af Afghanistan and al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. but it opened a tremendous door for me in terms of Iranian national security, decision-making, thinking, context. So one of the things the book will bring is that perspective that very few Americans have, that Iranian diplomats and the infrastructure, the foreign policy and national security infrastructure in Iran can take and do take over and over again decisions based on Iran's national interest, that we can deal with them in terms of their national interest. Then the other example is in terms of its domestic politics. Mm -hmm. There's a widely held assumption in the United States that Iran is some sort of fragile political order, just waiting to collapse or implode. So if there's a demonstration, we think this is evidence that the, that the government there is going to fall, and it will inaugurate some new political order that inevitably will be more secular, more democratic, and more pro-American. I take on a lot of those assumptions to really make the argument that the revolution, the Islamic revolution that occurred in the late 1970s was a fundamental turn in Iran's identity its, and its political order domestically. And that for 30 years, the Iranians inside Iran have really built a very stable, durable political order, in a sense analogous to what, the, um, what happened in the People's Republic of China. Or even some of my Iranian colleagues would say, like what happened with the, the revolution in France. Mm -hmm. That the revolution in Iran was just as important to the change in Iran's identity in its regional context, and that the United States needs to come to terms with the fact that that political order is going to be the political order in Iran for, for quite some time. And just as we came to terms with the People's Republic of China and reoriented our relationship with the People's Republic of China fundamentally in the early 1970s when Nixon went to China, that's where the going to Tehran title comes mm -hmm. from, that we need to fundamentally reorient our relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran and not necessarily that Obama needs to fly to Tehran, but we need to, in terms of our thinking about Iran, really come to terms with the reality of the Islamic Republic, what that means for how they act in terms of their foreign policy, and what that means in terms of their domestic political order. Why do you think we're not doing that today, and, and why do these myths perpetuate? This is one of the most surprising um, and interesting aspects that I think I've, I've I've come across in, in writing the book and researching the book. I think it has less to do about what goes on inside Iran than it has to do with us here in the United States, both in terms of our political culture, political elites, academia, the media. And I think it, it, comes, it could come down to maybe one idea in particular, this, the idea of American exceptionalism, that we, are, we have these big ideas um, from Manifest Destiny to <laughs> many, uh, you know, many other, to the Cold War, many big ideas. And that we, that somehow everybody would want to be like us and s people try to, to, to be like us. And the inevitable process of modernization will transform countries to be like us if they only had the chance. Mm -hmm. This is something that I think is really ingrained in our political culture. And only when we're forced to, or when we have, I think, great statesmanship, can we really change that dynamic. Now, with Nixon, as controversial a president as he was, the opening to China really was a mark of great statesmanship. He took the decision for the opening to China at a time when we needed to get out of Vietnam, we had the super superpower uh, conflict with the Soviet Union, and he saw the United States as a power in relative decline at the time, mm -hmm. economically, militarily, politically. We're in a similar situation today. And what I find the most challenging aspect of, of the ideas that I'm putting forward in the book is, can we, can we have statesmanship akin to what China, Nixon did with China, mm -hmm. where we realize, we understand, we come to terms with the fact that the United States is a power in relative decline? And how do we stop the hemorrhaging, maintain our position of, of credibility and power, and maybe even build on that? We're not going to be able to do it through military, I mean, through political superiority or hegemony, or economic superiority or hegemony. We're trying to do it a bit with, mili with the military in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it's not going very well. Mm -hmm. We need to really have a fundamentally different construct to figure out how to come to terms with regional, uh, important regional players whether that's Turkey, whether that's Iran. 
it's very difficult for us to do so. I think particularly because of our political culture, this idea of American exceptionalism, but also because of ingrained, entrenched uh, domestic interest groups that I think are amplified in our political system, not only because of our heritage and our history, but because of our relative security, mm -hmm. which makes uh, the voice of interest groups as important as they are in any context, have even a bigger voice in our domestic context. So we have both the big ideas issue, American exceptionalism, and almost the small ideas, mm -hmm. the interest groups, coming together in a very powerful way to constrain the United States from taking steps and opportunities that I think are, are to me, very obviously in the U.S. interest. Okay, let's talk about the methodology you, you're using to write the book. How are you doing the research? Well, the first, first piece of the, the research and what I'm trying to pull together are a lot of my own experiences, drawing from my own experiences in dealing with and talking to Iranian officials, um, both Iranian diplomats as well as senior Iranian officials across the political spectrum in Iran. From the, you know, we call them just for shorthand, kind of the conservatives or the hardliners to the more reformists um, and so called moderates. It's a very simplistic kind of portrayal of the political system there. Mm -hmm. But essentially, just to give you an idea of the range of, of contexts, at a, I think at a high level throughout Iran, that, I've, uh, that I developed starting with my official negotiations with them and talks with them over Afghanistan and Al Qaeda in the wake of 9 11. Mm -hmm. Starting with that, but developing it from 2001 to the present. So I've had nearly 10 years of working on this consistently, constantly over time to really try to, to develop an understanding of their security concerns, their decision making, and to really bring that, um, to really bring that into the book. As I, as I mentioned, one of the most distorting aspects of the U.S. debate about Iran is that we never hear the, either the official um, interpretation or justification or idea about something, nor do we, do we really hear from people who support the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. We hear about various dissidents and people who have had problems, people who have emigrated, but we never hear from the tens of millions of Iranians who are still in Iran and m many of whom, if not most of whom, support the Islamic Republic, even if they don't necessarily support the person in President Ahmadinejad, I would argue that the vast majority still support the idea of the Islamic Republic. Let me give you an example of, of one of the things that I found in doing, just doing the research and drawing on my personal mm -hmm. experiences. No matter how many books people read on Iran, rarely does it come out that the political, in the political system in Iran, the president is term limited. Sure. But this is something in my discussions with Iranian officials that would come out, whether it was dealing with President the issue of President Ahmadinejad, or before him, President Khatami, who was a more of a reformist figure, seen as a little bit more um, in line with Western ideas of, of, of modernization. In both cases, Iranian diplomats would talk about, or Iranian officials from across the political spectrum, would talk about the national interest for the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. And if someone would mention, well, but President Ahmadinejad said this, or President Khatami said this, there was all due deference to their head of state. But there was a, there was, it was clear for them, and they would say it repeatedly, well, yes, he is important, but the system does not rest on one person, whether it's the president who's term limited or even the supreme leader. That one of the things that's interesting and important about the system inside the Islamic Republic, almost like the system inside China, is that both the founding father, father of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini, as well as Chairman Mao in China, they both bequeathed to their systems, not, a, not, not a, in, to their countries, not a Western-style democratic system, but a competitive political system that endures beyond personalities. So what I try to bring from my personal experience in talking to so many different Iranian officials and people who um, live in Iran, support the Islamic Republic, is this idea of the enduring nature of the Islamic Republic regardless of who's president. Mm -hmm. So if President Ahmadinejad says something that they don't like or we don't like, the, the problem is contained in that there will be people who will challenge him mm -hmm. the next time around in the next election. So the first thing I do is I draw from, from my contacts um, across, the, across the spectrum in Iran, which I think is very unique. Um, it, it will be a unique contribution to, to the debate. The, others, the other is um, 
of course, going through our archi archival material from each of the U.S. administrations dating back uh, to 19, from 1979 to document the number of times and the depth of interaction, constructive interaction in many cases, between the United States and the Islamic Republic. So one of the other myths is, well, the Islamic Republic is so radical, so hostile to the United States, and in fact needs the hostility towards the United States to legitimate its own political mm -hmm. order. One of the ways that I'm going about, I think, deconstructing that, that myth and rebutting that myth is to go back and show how every U.S. administration reached out to the Islamic Republic of Iran to cooperate with it in some way, whether it was President Reagan's administration with what we know about Iran-Contra, the Iran-Contra mm -hmm. scandal. The first George Bush administration reached out to the Islamic Republic to get Iran's help to secure the release of U.S. Hostage mm -hmm. hostages in Lebanon. The Clinton administration cooperated indirectly with the Iranians to supply the Muslims in Bosnia with weapons during the Balkan conflict in the 1990s. And of course, the, the Bush administration that, that I worked for, cooperated with, sought Iran's help for Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda. In each one of these cases, if you go through the, all the archival material and you interview people, in each one of these cases of cooperation, it was the United States that cut off the cooperation for reasons that had nothing to do with Iran for reasons that had to do with our domestic politics for the most part. In each one of these cases, the Iranians delivered not everything the United States asked for, but almost everything. Mm -hmm. They delivered a lot of what we asked for. It was the United States, though, that cut off each one of these um, periods of engagement. Going back to Iran-Contra, Iran-Contra failed not because the Iranians didn't come through, but because of a constitutional crisis here in the United States when Reagan administration officials tried to divert the proceeds from selling weapons to, to the Iranians to fund the Contras in Nicaragua in contravention with, with U.S. law. So we've had this, you know, this really messy situation on the U.S. side undermine cooperation throughout. So that's the other, um, that's the other major area I'll, I'll, be drawing, I'll be drawing on. I am very curious in listening to you um, to know whether there are any gender barriers um, mm -hmm. when you're talking with Iranian Ir Iranian officials. Um, as a woman, did you have any difficulty? I had no difficulty whatsoever. Okay. Um, it's, I think that the inside the Islamic Republic, I think this is one of the other myths, that it's a misogynistic mm -hmm. political yes. order. I think this is really a myth. Before the Islamic Revolution, women were able to, of course, walk the streets without their hair covered, and there was this idea of kind of a liberal atmosphere for women. But in fact, many women couldn't really go to school or hold uh, senior government jobs mm -hmm. or senior jobs in business or the professions. Now, many of that was, m m most of that, much of that, was almost self-selective. Conservative families didn't really, weren't that interested in having women, particularly from villages and non-urban areas, having their daughters or their wives go to university to mingle, um, you know, to be with people of the opposite sex or to be in positions in the office where they're, um, you know, they're vulnerable in a mm -hmm. sense. Now, of course, many women before the Islamic Republic was created did benefit if they were in the elite. But if you weren't in the elite in Iran, if you were a woman and most of the population were not elite, mm -hmm. you really had a problem in terms of educational and career advancement. What the Islamic Republic has done is really even the field. So while elite women, of course, can't go out covered, There's, you have to be covered in, in the streets and in the professions, there is there, the system for education and for the professions really essentially opened for the first time to people outside of northern Tehran, which mm -hmm. is the most cosmopolitan part of Iran, in a way where if you look at the statistics, the UNESCO statistics and other you know, international statistics in terms of literacy rates mm -hmm. um, and participation of women in many different sectors, the advancement of women over the past 30 years has been strikingly significant inside Iran. I can you know, even tell you from my personal experience of, of being there, it's, you know, you look out the window and you'll see, you're in a car, you look out the window that there's a woman driving a minibus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are women who, you know, there's a woman who's, women who are ministers in the government, women who's driving, a woman who's driving a bus. At the university, one of the big problems is that there are so many women there, they're concerned that there aren't, there are, there's going to be such a disproportionate number of women that they will outnumber 
the men and they may need to institute oh, an affirmative yeah. action <laughs> <laughs> an affirmative action program uh -huh. for men. Um, it also becomes, it, the Islamic Republic does a lot of very interesting things. The other, one of the other interesting things it's done is it's one of the most advanced countries in terms of family planning. Initially, in the early days of the revolution, the revolutionaries encouraged large families as part of this idea sure. for um, greater population in the Islamic Republic. But very soon, they realized what kind of you know the destructive um, aspects of this for for Iranians um, for modernization and just for the for the for the country. And they instituted a pretty comprehensive family planning program, where the country today it's it's pretty easy to get family planning advice and assistance. Um, and there's also a lot of emphasis on you know, things that, that we've come to relatively, um, you know, rel relatively late, I think, in terms of embracing uh, women to, to breastfeed their children, to have places in the workplace to do so. Mm -hmm. um, I often travel with my young children, and I find you know, the Islamic Republic is one of, one of the few places where it's easy mm -hmm. um, to bring them, and there's an understanding about women in the workplace also having children and having this, this, this balance. I don't say that to say that it's any kind of ideal place. It mm -hmm. is not by any stretch, but I don't think that there's, I don't think there are many places that are ideal. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this, there, it is a myth that it's a really misogynistic place. Um, there's a lot, tremendous room for improvement. I think Iranians of all genders and walks of life are constantly working to make it a better place. There are many, many areas that need improvement. But um, it's, I think, part of a caricature that just misses a lot of the, the struggle that women have in all societies. They struggle in Iran as well. But um, there are a lot of, there have also been some very tangible benefits over the past, uh, past 30 years. Very good. Let's talk a little bit about some of the findings in your book. I know it's a bit mm -hmm. premature and that it's, it's not um, completed yet, but can you share some of them with us? I think the, some of the, the most important findings are how difficult it will be, particularly on the U.S. side, to really transform the relationship, to come to grips with the Islamic Republic, that it will take a tremendous amount of almost re-education on our parts to really come to terms with what goes on inside the Islamic Republic and to take a much more, uh, to take a really sober look at their foreign policy and national security strategy. The other piece is how, how difficult it will be to manage, deal with um, our allies in the region so that a realignment between the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran is not perceived as a zero-sum game against our allies. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, to look, at, um, to look at Israel, to look at Saudi Arabia, and how to, one of the important findings is that there's um, a tremendous amount of concern within Saudi Arabia, within Israel, um, U.S. allies, of how the U.S. could turn the relationship with Iran. The necessity to do so, now, the necessity to do so takes almost two extremes. The necessity to do so is if the United States could somehow get its act together and figure out a way to deal constructively with the Islamic Republic, very few people in the Middle East think that we can do that. The other extreme is how are we then going to militarily take care of this problem with the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the major, those are I think the major difficulties of how, how the United States is going to deal with, um, with our allies in the region to make any kind of realignment and relations not a zero sum game. And so I'd say that's probably one of the, the most disturbing, most challenging findings in the research so far is how entrenched um, views are not only in the United States but in the region in terms of how to deal with, um, with the rise of Iran. Very good. Thanks so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you very much. For more information about Professor Leverett and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.